Well, I'll tell you what we have lost, but they've never come back. The stream in the bottom, the beck in the bottom, was always full of waterfalls. There aren't any now. We did have red squirrels, but all of them seem to have gone now. The numbers on, on all species have gone down. I mean, I'll remember, you know, like the lapwings, you would see absolutely thousands of them. All these little insects, I mean, I, I didn't really know what they were, but it was fascinating to see them all. And you would not get that now. It's certainly a different life to what we used to have. I mean, to me, you know, that's all I live for is, well, now I've got to this age sort of thing, it's the, uh, you know, it's the countryside, and it, it, it's, you know, it, it's disappointing to see how it's changing. We've been farming and reshaping our countryside for thousands of years. Yet until the 20th century, agriculture made remarkably little impact upon the natural world. Many native animals had adapted to our traditional methods of farming, nesting and grazing in fields worked by horse-drawn machinery. Snowdonia hill country farmer Gwyn Thomas was eight years old when he began helping with the haymaking. My first proper job of helping my father was uh, walking behind the cutter bar when he was with a horse cutting the grass in the fields. The difference now to that time was um, the amount of wildlife under your feet really when you were walking through the hay. The ground nesting birds that were around then, the nest could be seen and and move to one side in case the chicks or the eggs were, were damaged. The same with the little field mice, you know. They were moved to one side and the bar would cut much higher than the modern uh, machinery now. So a lot of wildlife now, if they are there on the ground, they are being actually killed or their nests have been destroyed by the system of farming. That's what's changed, the mechanisation of farming. The introduction of faster growing grasses meant wild animals didn't have time to raise their young before haymaking started. I would like to go back to slow maturing grasses that would be cut end of July, uh, beginning of August maybe. If you have ground nesting birds, they nest at a certain time of year. So the later you cut the grass, the better it is for the wildlife because they can fly away or, or run away from the machines. Horses disappeared from farms in the years after the war as part of a nationwide push for improved productivity. I was born right at the end of the 1940s, exactly at the time of the end of the era of horsepower and the beginning of tractor horsepower, something completely different. At the end of the war, food production was absolutely crucial to our country and it was during that time that the early insecticides were used. On wet sports days I was allowed to come back to the farm and I'd sit in the milking parlour with my dad milking the cows. My job was to spray the backs of the cows to stop the blue bottles landing and making the cows swish their tails and uh, cause a nuisance in the parlour. So I was quite a crack shot with a little sprayer. It was a Cooper sprayer and I was using neat DDT to spray the backs of the cows with. Indiscriminate spraying killed off a lot of the food needed by our native animals. Big problem insect was aphids. I was using a nerve gas developed in the First World War. It was called Metasystox 55. It was an organophosphate, and we used that here for over 20 years. Brilliant stuff, controlled the aphids, destroyed all the insects as well. Absolutely disastrous for grey partridge chicks at that time of the year, which were being reared on the insects which had been sprayed. Hedgerows were being bulldozed to create large fields for intensive farming. 
There were perhaps 40 miles of hedges here at the farm, right through the 1970s and 80s, miles of those hedges were taken out, really sadly, but it's in the name of progress. The wildlife just couldn't cope with those dramatic changes. Every year, all the local sparrows from the villages all around and from Norwich, just to the north of the farm, would congregate and come to High Ash Farm to here. Not a hundred, not a thousand, but between 10 and 20,000. It was like a flock of locusts, impossible to imagine today. Tree sparrows and house sparrows. Huge flocks going down into the crop, dropping some of the grain on the ground and just eating some, but wasting most of it. My father was obsessed with controlling the sparrows and he would go across the field behind us and I'd be carrying one of the guns, he'd have the other gun. They were both loaded, both double barrel shotguns. He'd clap his hands in the air, fire into the sparrow flock. Sparrow shot is like dust and a hundred sparrows would drop out of the flock with each shot. Unbelievable. About late 1970s, I suddenly noticed there was just two sparrows left in the farmyard. I hadn't even seen it happen. Whether it was a combination of the chemicals we were using or the war of attrition, and of course anything that could be shot was shot. And suddenly the farmyard was a different place. It was quiet. Something was missing. Other species also suffered. Turtle doves, that had long been a familiar sight in the Norfolk countryside, began to disappear. During the summer months, all the tall hawthorn hedges around the farm would have turtle doves in them, singing at the top of the hedges that lovely sound that you get in full summer, the purring sound of the male. It's just lovely. Eventually, they started to decline hugely. Farmers like Chris and Gwyn believe it is possible to halt the loss in wild species and farm alongside nature as it's been done in the past. I feel that we are interfering a lot um, with nature and not understanding it maybe. And you don't have to be the science all the time. It's, it's just handed down from generation to generation. One of the species he's trying to help is the native twite. Just 30 pairs remain in Wales, mainly in the valleys around Gwyn's farm. So I'm wanting to get habitat in place for them so that they can increase in numbers and not decrease as they have been doing throughout Wales. It's very important for me to leave something behind instead of uh, taking from the ground all the time. Gwyn has been restoring dry stone walls to provide shelter for wild animals. He has also cut stock numbers from 1,200 down to 300 sheep and reintroduced Welsh black cattle after an absence of more than half a century. This is helping the mountain heather to recover and recreating a habitat for native species. Hares that disappeared for decades are now feeding in the valley. And because Gwyn's farm is organic, chemicals are no longer leaching into the river. Fish are coming back. And so, too, are the otters. Farmers live close to the land, so we're more aware than most people about the loss of species in our countryside. One of the things I wanted to do was to regain the balance of nature, which was here during my childhood years. I wanted to get the wildlife back. I wanted to see the harvest mice on the farm again. I wanted to see the sparrows on the farm again. And so it was the next challenge. I'd grown 10 tonnes of wheat per hectare and uh, I wanted to prove that I could still produce food and have a crop of wildlife as well. The sparrows are returning to Chris's farm. I started putting up nest boxes for them, provide food all the year round for them with a special hide I have, and um, the right habitat, dense hedges. I've planted about eight miles of hedges, 27,800 hedging plants gone in with oak trees or ash trees every 50 metres. Perfect. So reduce the field size, the wildlife's coming back in quick response. 
Changing farming practices to help give nature a home takes time and huge effort, which farmers say is only possible through the support of conservation subsidies. Environmental scheme subsidies are crucial to farmers like me who want to encourage the wildlife back to the farm but can't afford to do so. To halt and reverse the decline in wildlife is a really difficult thing to do. I've now got the balance right, I think, between food production and care of the environment. I want to get back to maybe wildlife again under my grandchildren's feet and I then can say to them, well, this is how it was when I was a little boy. Not saying, well, when I was a little boy, we did have them, but now they've all gone.